Okay, I have 12 o'clock. Start on time to be prompt is what I've always been trained, so we'll get rolling. Um, welcome with the audience that we have and welcome to anybody who's going to watch this later. This is our April 22nd Parent Information Committee meeting. Um, you'll notice that we are in Zoom platform completely um, with the district's administration center under construction. All of us are housed over at Central Auditorium and our technology is a little bit um, behind with us sitting here. So Zoom was the best way to record this meeting. And so we're gonna use the Zoom format. Um, the topic for today is school improvement and the school, new school improvement process. And we have our curriculum and instruction team here to uh, explain that. And I will hand it off to Penny Miller Nelson. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. We have a set of slides to talk you through today. If someone could signal to me that you can see those slides, that would be helpful. Thank you, Cindy. So we are really thrilled to be here with you today. We have a great group from our curriculum team, as Mike said, uh, and you can see their names there on the screen. We have Jessica with us, who is our director of special services, Allison, our secondary coordinator. Uh, we have Jen as our elementary coordinator. DeAndre is with us, our, our new, he's still new, uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion director. Um, and we have Anne, and we're so happy to have Anne here as our, our multi-tiered systems of support coordinator. So we have a team approach today, uh, and we've chunked the slides. Uh, we're really excited to talk with you about our new way of thinking and working through continuous improvement. We, over the years, have uh, worked hard at our PIC meetings to bring you topics that are relevant, that we're really proud of, uh, both across the district and specific schools and in classrooms. And we've tried during that time to also paint a picture for you of where our areas of needed growth are. So to pair that conversation with, oh, we're so proud of these strengths, and oh, we know we have some areas of growth. And the continuous improvement process that we have now really embraces both of those. It, it gives us an opportunity to lift up our strengths and leverage those across the district. And it also lets us really zone in on the areas that matter most for our growth and improvement. So we're excited uh, to share that with you today. Quick agenda, we will start with a conversation about what is my KIP. We will talk about assessing needs, about building plans. We hope you leave understanding the power of the team-based approach that we have in this work. And we will give you some status updates at the end. I hope you've seen before uh, in district communications and in other places, our district vision statement. Uh, I do want to acknowledge that this is being recorded today. So if you are comfortable and able, we invite you to use the chat feature, or you can unmute yourself uh, if you wish and share based on this prompt. So as I read the vision statement, what is one word that really connects with you and why? Our vision statement is to lead with respect, trust, and courage to ensure an equitable, collaborative, and inclusive culture, enable all to achieve success. I'll give you a moment to process that. And then if I can ask some members of the team to help monitor the chat and share uh, what you see in there, I'd appreciate it. Sorry about that. Penny, we have Kim says equitable. Great, powerful word. It is a core foundation. I hope you leave today understanding how we have woven equity through all aspects of our work. Thanks for sharing that. And again, feel welcome to unmute if you're more comfortable doing that. Okay, we will move on. Um, I'll just share with you when we facilitated this process with other groups the um, idea of equity really translates and the power of doing that together through collaboration. So this vision statement is what's guiding our work and will continue to guide our work. I hope you'll see these words recursive today through our conversation. So let's dig into what is MyKIP. As you can see on your screen, 
it really is an integrated process. It is very iterative. We uh, used to approach school improvement as a once a year activity where we would bring principals together with some teachers, develop plans based on our best thinking. Uh, we often worked in isolation and silos. We often didn't consider the depth of the data that we actually had at our fingertips. So this new way of working really asks us to think about improving student outcomes, looking through that lens of whole child. And if you've been with us previously in PIC meetings, we've talked about the whole child and we'll revisit that today. It really asks us to be more strategic about digging deep into assessing needs to get to root cause, and then moving into that planning phase where we look at evidence-based practices, we look at how we can accomplish our work through a systems approach. And the funding part really is using our funds in the most efficient and effective ways, knowing what all of those sources are. So we are really excited about this work. We feel we have a strong foundation to move forward, thinking again that this is an iterative process that we will revisit throughout the school year. I just love this slide. This is one of the most powerful pieces to really explain uh, what my KIPP is about and how we're going to function here in Midland. So I'll draw your attention to the upper corner of this slide. And I'll just note that this slide, as well as the previous and the next few, are actually directly from the Michigan Department of Education. We are aligning to their uh, new continuous improvement framework. They really ask you to think about those three components around mindset shift, process, and platform. And we've been investing a lot of time with our, our leadership team, with our administrative team, and soon with our teachers in the mindset shift space, understanding that this is a different way for us to think about continuous improvement, to have that student-centered approach, that whole child approach, uh, that again, it is very iterative uh, that we will conduct that deep needs assessment, we will plan with intention and fund accordingly. The part that we're really excited about as well is this pull towards systems thinking. We no longer can work in isolation. We are a school system, we are uh, together. So while we fully appreciate and recognize that each of our schools are individual school communities that have special needs and special strengths, there are certain pieces that really we need to function as a school system. And so this way of thinking really almost levels us up to making sure that we have our house in order the way that we need to, so that we can best ultimately best serve our students. I'll draw your attention to equity at the bottom. Uh, that really is meant to be the spans of uh, a continuum throughout all of our work, right? This is a thread that we will continue to see it is a lens by which we're making decisions. And it also is an explicit effort for us here at Midland Public Schools. So I just wanna draw your attention to that, that we're really focusing on equity of opportunities, environments, and supports. And, and I'll use both of those um, phrases. It is both embedded in everything we do, also very explicit opportunities where we are going to um, focus on our learning and our leading in equity. I'm gonna turn it over to Ann, who will take us through the next slides. Ann, are you there? I'm here, I'm ready. All right, um, so we're going to spend a little bit of time here talking about the whole child. So Midland Public Schools has historically done a really great job of focusing on the academic learning and achievement of most of our students. Um, but uh, we now realize, especially with the pandemic and then the historic flooding last spring, the importance of addressing the physical, behavioral, social, and emotional aspects, um, the cognitive aspects as well, because they impact a child's overall well-being and the ability for them to fully participate in learning. So this model here, this whole child model, it moves us into a deeper partnership with all of our stakeholders, including our families, um, our community. And we are very, very fortunate to have a lot of strong partnerships within our community. And we will continue to stay connected with those and then also work to expand our partnerships in order to serve our students and families and our staff. And really, the goal is that we become closer to having all of our students be healthy, safe, engaged, supported, and challenged. All right, the continuous improvement cycle 
It is important to recognize that this cycle occurs within the vision, the mission, and the beliefs of our district and is an ongoing process. Um, so our plans can and should be adjusted throughout the year based on our monitoring and evaluation. And this makes sure that we give attention to our um, implementation fidelity and that we are maximizing our student impact. Uh, this cycle focuses around the whole child at the center that you can see there in the graphic. And really the continuous improvement cycle operationalize, operationalizes the MyKit process, um, which Penny already went over at its core is the needs, plans, and funds. Next slide. Um, so Penny touched a little bit on systems thinking already. Um, again, the definition is here. It's a series of interdependent and aligned processes and people working together toward a common goal to bring desired results. And we really just want to define a couple of um, pieces here. So interdependent, meaning that processes and people cannot function at their highest levels without each other. And that aligned and toward a common goal means that processes and people must be focused on the same thing and everyone must, be, must clearly understand the goal. So you'll notice a lot of our work, we've also been leading with our vision because um, we're all in pursuit of that. Um, like Penny already mentioned, in previous school improvement models, we would view components really through an isolated lens, really at the building level. And so we want to consider how they are a critical piece of the, the larger system of our district system. Go to the next slide. This is a graphic from Michigan Department of Education. This is the um, MTSS graphic, if you will, that shows the five essential components. And we are utilizing the MTSS or multi-tiered system of supports framework as our strategy within our continuous improvement process. It's really a way of us being able to do business. Um, it is a continuous improvement framework and it's spanning all aspects of the school system. So it helps us organize our resources. It promotes the use of evidence-based practices of high quality instruction, interventions, assessments, uh, really to ensure the needs of every student are met and they can reach their full potential. And then finally, when we also consider systems thinking, um, we have to make sure that we have alignment at all levels. So we have our district goals and then our school goals should be aligned with our district goals. Our department and grade levels should then be aligned with school. Um, and you can kind of see down there the classroom. And then ultimately we want to make sure that we, our students are reaching their full potential and we're maximizing that impact. We are moving away from um, these again kind of isolated and in independent schools to a district that's organized within that support system and i think dj, DJ is next hey everyone um and i'm here to talk about uh, the connections to uh, dei as uh, penny uh, touched on earlier uh, equity being at the bottom of that graphic uh in the slide above uh you know we we all right, have the understanding that you can't have uh, continuous improvement without equity um, and conversations amongst our team and across the state. Um, that is the um, consensus uh, all around. Uh, we want to use continuous improvement process as a vehicle to ingrain uh, equity in the work uh, that we're doing. Um, sorry, you can hear that noise. But, um, and, you know, and the work is really to uh, dismantle uh, systemic barriers to opportunity gaps, rather than the old way of thinking of achievement gaps. And what focusing on opportunity gaps um, allows us to do is to shift our thinking from um, the deficit, um, deficit thinking or mindset and focus more on the assets that kids have and looking more internally at uh, the system and where we are uh, missing in our support. Move on to the next one. Um, as I've touched on earlier, um, a moment ago, uh, teams improvement is the goal is equity for all. Uh, we want to create a culture of inquiry, uh, and the goal of continuous improvement is to dismantle, to dismantle system barriers, uh, to our learning opportunities. And we want to change, uh, individuals and systems, individuals as us, the way we're, um, our, our frame of thinking is and the systems, uh, in which we work. And as this graphic shows here, um, you know, we, we you know, initially um, got into working towards, you know, equality. It was um, 
kind of a one one size fits all approach. Um, we have various um, stakeholders with various needs. Um, and what we used to work is to provide the same uh, support, you know, very cookie cutter to where as you see in above graphic, um, that, that it doesn't necessarily fit um, everyone. And our shift in thinking takes us to at the bottom to where we looked at our system and we were able to recognize the assets that you know students and people are bringing uh, to our system and tailor the needs um, uh, to help them uh, you know, reach the goal, not lowering expectations, but uh, meeting uh, students where they're at to help them uh, get to a place of uh, success. And this quote here, uh, every student deserves a great teacher, not by chance, but by design. Um, and here we uh, just think that um, this goes into our bigger why. Um, uh, we don't want it to be a random thing uh, that, uh, that students, um, you know, off chance that they meet, um, uh, that, their, that their needs are met. And we don't want it to be an accident. We wanna be intentional uh, about our support system and our approach to reaching kids where they are. Um, so. So bringing this back to what my kit looks like in practice, uh, my kit requires us to do uh, a needs assessment, a thorough needs assessment. And based on that needs assessment, develop our plans and then align funds at, after we've established our needs. And one of the things that Penny mentioned and unpacked for us a little bit more and um, DeAndre highlighted it through, through DEI is focusing on the needs of the whole child. And so when we've been looking at academic uh, standards, academic achievement, we also know that we need to look at other pieces of data to fully inform our needs assessment to develop our plans. So one of the other types of data that we've been considering heavily is a part of our process is gathering perception data. So we ask ourselves the question, what does gathering school perception data help us to understand? It helps us to understand uh, quite a few things that better informs the decisions that we're making. We know that when we're looking through a systems perspective, when we're um, making sure that equity is a part of the system to identify opportunities for our, our students. We know that understanding perception data is critical to this process. But understanding perception data helps us understand shared values and, and beliefs, uh, our vision, uh, and our vision we know is, is, is critical to what we want to accomplish. Helps us understand our culture and climate, which is critical. Uh, we also know that culture, um, culture trumps innovation and all of the pieces and how people feel about that have a, have a huge impact on, on learner outcomes. Uh, it helps us understand strategies that will help students learn and it helps us understand uh, teacher behavior and then also what is important to students, among other things. Perception data is, is pretty critical to understand the current reality of our situation, of our, of our systems and um, best meet the individual student needs through the whole child lens. One of the other types of data that we've highlighted through our needs assessment process in continuous improvement is looking at systems data. Uh, as DeAndre kind of unpacked for us, we have historically looked at achievement data and identified some of the gaps in, in achievement and look to those as, as things that we need to fix. When we're looking at um, a systems perspective, we want to shift to understanding where the opportunity gaps are or the, the places in the systems that we need to address. So systems data helps us to understand curriculum, instruction, assessment for learning, uh, collaboration, what it looks like, uh, learning environment, which we know is critical if we don't have the learning environment established in a way for students to be able to learn it can have a huge impact on, on student uh, achievement data. Leadership and sustainable learning organization, as well as the integrity and fidelity with which we're implementing whatever initiative it might be that we're focusing on at the time. If you can go to the next slide. Uh, the, the key piece to this uh, new way of looking at continuous improvement is for us to know 
we're still looking at student achievement data. That, do that doesn't go away. All of the work that we're doing through continuous improvement is still to have a positive impact on our student achievement data. And we know in our, you know, in our institution and in Midland Public Schools, how important that is our, our culture of excellence. But we also know that the best way to do that are looking at some of the root causes, which oftentimes lend itself to the systems, systems pieces or systems opportunities or systems gaps that we need to address. So looking at continuous improvement, we know the outcome data is, is critical. And we also know that through our needs assessment process, we've widened what that looks like to look at not only achievement data, but in conjunction in triangulation when we're looking at perception data, as well as systems data as a part of it. When we've unpacked our needs, uh, we've gone through, we've looked at these multiple different types of data. We've identified a, a few challenges and uh, the, the challenges through our needs assessment are listed in the, the bullets that you see on your screen. And I'll take the time to uh, go through some of those, all of those for us. So what we found based on our data is that some of our students don't feel included in their school environment uh, and they don't feel safe. And some, some of them don't feel like they belong. We know we have an amazing system. We know we have a, a, an amazing um, district. Um, and as amazing as that is, we still are having um, students in, in places, and if not all of them, but we know that when we want to address all of our students, we have to make sure that we find safe places and help our students to feel like they belong. When we're looking at the research, whether it's Maslow's hierarchy of needs, functioning at the, functioning at the um, whole child uh, model, we know that if students don't have these attachments or connections and relationships to our school, we know that they're not going to have the learner outcomes that we're, um, you know, that's expect, expected from our district. We also still have students uh, not reaching their curricular expectations. Not all students have the same opportunities and access to a curricular experience. And we know that there are still some students in our, stu in our system that are not having their individual needs met. Through our needs assessment, we've also learned that there's a lack of SEL competencies and trauma-informed strategies for students and adults. And I know that the PIC meeting has been a place where we've taken some time to address some of those pieces individually with their own presentations. Uh, data is not used in a systemic way to uh, make decisions. Again, we've talked a little bit about NWA and what that looks like through PIC. And then prioritizing needs and aligning evidence-based innovative strategies is essential for students to feel safe, valued, treated with kindness, respect, and work together to make our world a better place. And that part ties back to the multi-tiered system of supports that Anne had talked about when she uh, sh shared that model with you. And that's what all of that is about, making sure that we have the right strategies, the right supports, the right pieces in place so that all students have the same opportunities to be successful in our district. All right, as Allison kind of wrapped up what the needs um, phase looks like, we move into then the planning phase. And through collective inquiry and a team-based approach, uh, we'll examine evidence-based practices and create our plans. So these plans are grounded in implementation science and are thoughtful of the way change needs to occur to ensure implementation to scale and with sustainability. So really looking at what is best and how we're going to move forward. So the plan will be created in support of these two goal areas. Our first goal is to create a safe and collaborative culture and learning experience for students that embraces diversity, is inclusive and equitable for all students, and meets their individual needs by the end of the 2024-25 school year, as measured by our success criteria indicators and end targets. Our second goal is to create a team-driven comprehensive screening and assessment system to drive low inference data-based decision-making, providing better access and opportunity to an equitable curriculum with supports for students, again, by the end of the 2024-25 school year and measured by our success criteria indicators and end targets. 
both of those goal areas are driven by that needs assessment and tie back to our why. Um, so again, just focusing on that, that equity piece and making sure all of our students are included and feel safe in their environment. So as noted, the team-based approach is critical in our new model for continuous improvement. We've formed the Midland Public Schools Continuous Improvement Leadership Team, which has teachers, administrators, and representatives um, that are from various angles and stakeholders. We are currently meeting monthly to engage in learning and planning. And the purpose is to lead and monitor the implementation of the district improvement plan and district initiatives. This team is a decision making body and will be anchored in a culture of collective responsibility that is collegial, collaborative and professional. This team should take the place of the school improvement team, data committee and other system improvement teams. So again, taking those siloed work teams and creating it into one nice comprehensive team. So as we kind of look at this social discipline window, it really speaks to how we are shifting to a more team-based approach. And we really want to engage our school community as we are striving to do work with others rather than two or four or not four. Um, so as we do that, we are creating an encouraging and nurturing environment for this work to occur. So as we engage uh, as a leadership team, uh, we remain connected with these guiding principles for continuous improvement that we would like to share with you today. Um, we agree to create opportunities to openly discuss, challenge, and confront inequities. We commit to increasing the ways in which the district can center the needs of our students. We commit to honest and transparent transformation of district culture and practices so students, staff, families, and community members feel safe, visible, valued, respected, and connected. Uh, we agree to implement reciprocal communication, not just top down. And we also accept and expect non-closure. We would like to highlight that these are in direct connection to the board proclamation and our vision statement and represent shared leadership and ownership of the learning and leading amongst our team. As Allison noted earlier, we engage in the needs assessment process as a district. And based on our needs assessment process, these are the four initial areas of focus that we have identified. Team-based leadership, communication, multi-tiered system of supports, and professional learning. It's important to note that each school will complete a continuous improvement plan and it will, they will all include these four areas. We will provide guidance as a leadership team to all of the building level teams. It's also important to note that as a leadership team, we dug into these four areas uh, a little more deeply and we helped to identify different priorities and considerations uh, for building teams, which will help them in creating their building level plans. Um, earlier, Allison touched on the needs and Jessica touched on the plan. So now we move to funding. And as we move into funding the plans, uh, we will consider all of the available funding sources, including general funding, state and federal grants, and other supplemental funds. We will make decisions that ensure the most effective and efficient use of our resources, considering sustainability along the way. I would like to invite you to reflect on all of the information that we shared today and also consider some of the previous topics that have been covered at PIC meetings. Uh, so some of the areas that we've touched on are NWEA assessments, the IB primary years program. Uh, we shared with you our return to school plan at the beginning of the year. We had a presentation on multi-tiered systems of support. We have also highlighted mental health and student support specialists, RISE and trauma-informed practices, restorative practices, a lot of our work around DEI and social emotional learning. We hope that you can see that there is a strong connection, not only to our vision statement, but also to our two goal areas. 
And as school teams create their continuous improvement plans, they will be considering how to advance many of these important pieces along the way. Thanks, Jen. Uh, we thought it was really just important to make those connections for you. The stories that we've shared over the past year or so, the topics we've brought to you in PIC, um, really help tell our story of our journey toward this new way of thinking and, uh, and working. And so it, it might seem uh, somewhat haphazard, but I can assure you that we have been really funneling ourselves in these directions, knowing uh, what we have been seeing and feeling from our school community. So there is a lot of excitement and enthusiasm about the work that's ahead of us. We're really building some true uh, collaboration and goodwill among our administrator team so that we can have stronger alignment and supporting them in doing that work uh, with their building teams as well. So we'd like to move uh, into a quick update phase of our time together. And I invite DeAndre to step in at any moment. I hope what you'll see through these next series of slides as we update you is the common theme of equity and the connection back to our vision statement, uh, as well as the two goal areas that we shared. Remember goal one is really a culture goal. It is about uh, us creating a culture of, of inclusion and belonging and safety and meeting students' needs. And our second goal is the comprehensive uh, balanced assessment system, which also has a very student-centered focus. And I just wanna remind you that that approach to a comprehensive balanced assessment system is again, both academic uh, and the social, emotional, behavioral, it's the whole child approach. So in our minds, we may think of it as academic and that might be a starting point for us, but it really is that whole child. So under goal one, uh, we are just pleased to share with you that our uh, equity audit team is in that final selection phase. And DeAndre, I'll invite you to unmute and share any particular details about that one since it is really exciting. Thanks, Penny. Uh, and yes, we um, concluded uh, some interviews with the final um, equity audit organizations uh, this week, and we'll be deliberating and making um, selection uh, hopefully by the end of this week. Um, and what that will um, look like, we really wanted a third party to provide you know, fresh eyes on MPS uh, as a district. Um, and throughout the audit, there will be a deep dive into our curriculum, uh, our policies and practices, um, and very importantly, um, perception uh, data from our stakeholders. So there will be focus groups comprised of, comprised of students, uh, faculty members, teachers, uh, community members, um, even uh, members of our board uh, will all be asked at some point to uh, be a part of this process. And uh, what that'll help us do is, um, you know, again, in, in the final report that uh, we expect to receive once it, um, once the initial audit concludes in November or December, um, we'll have a uh, touch point or a reference to, you know, refer to in planning and continuing the, um, uh, continuous improvement work. Um, yeah. Uh, the rest of this screen really represents a lot of collaboration that's been happening across our school community. As I noted, we're engaging in open dialogue uh, and DeAndre is helping lead that particularly around topics related to equity and inclusion, uh, as well as this work with my kit. We are really seeking to increase our engagement with families in the community. We're partnering with other organizations such as the Midland County Inclusion Alliance, the Cultural Awareness Coalition through the Midland Area Community Foundation, really anyone in our community who wants to uh, come alongside and partner, particularly in our diversity, equity, and inclusion work. We're really excited about that. We have an action team creating a survey and we will pair that up with the equity audit process Again, Allison talked about the importance of perception data for us. We believe that we have gathered that in many ways um, on our journey, but we really want to formalize that through a survey process to families, to students, and internally to our staff. And uh, we have some drafts in the works. We have an action team focused on DEI skill sets. 
And again, I'll just note that many of these teams are Midland Public employees, as well as community members, some from our DEI advisory team, as well as others. So we're really trying to embrace that, let's do this with one another, rather than to or for one another. That skill set team, uh, Jen is a leader of that team. We're really looking at what those skills are that we need to embed across the curriculum that will help build that culture that we desire for goal one. And there are some real direct actions, in particular the human library. Uh, we know that that's happened through Northwood University recently, and we have some interest in bringing that to our schools at our at the high school level for next year. The curriculum team, who's with you today, continues to partner with teachers in identifying opportunities to take a look at the curriculum materials and resources that we're using through the lens of equity, ensuring that uh, those materials represent. Uh, all voices uh, and, and all identities uh, in the most appropriate and inclusive ways. And that's really exciting work. We know that will pair back to our equity audit as well. A big chunk of that audit will be focused on teaching and learning. And there is some movement uh, and action happening in our human resource department, really being thoughtful about how we recruit, select, onboard, and of course, retain uh, teachers, administrators, support staff with that lens of diversity and equity. To continue with some updates for goal one, um, we are really focusing on professional learning in very targeted ways. We have an, a wonderful partnership with The Rock Center for Youth Development. I'm sure many of you are familiar with them. Uh, and we're focused on adult well-being for this year. They have brought amazing people to lead our professional learning at points along the year. We're really focused on uh, the adult piece in preparation to launch the curricular piece uh, in our six through 12 classrooms. We have a partnership with Sarah Owens and her new consulting business for RISE, which is Resilience in Students and Educators. This really is a helping us better understand trauma-informed practices, particularly in our elementary schools. It is not a programmatic approach, a program that we purchase and implement. It really is building our skills and capacity as the adults who work directly with students uh, to, again, use trauma-informed practices in a very uh, culturally responsive way. We, through our professional learning, have unpacked key parts of our board proclamation. That was such a powerful moment for us as a school community when our board adopted uh, that proclamation. But it's words on paper until we can make meaning of it and really move that into action. So we've spent time with our teachers and our administrators really understanding what that means and weaving that into this continuous improvement planning process. Uh, DeAndre, I'm going to throw it back to you to talk about the uh, racial equity challenge. Of course. Thanks, Penny. Um, so uh, in the span of 10 weeks, um, we are engaging in a racial equity challenge as a district. Um, we are at the midway point. This is week five. And each week, uh, using Canvas uh, as, a, as our platform, as a tool, really, um, to engage with uh, all our staff. Um, not just teachers, any uh, staff member, um, anybody that has an MPS um, email receives an invite to join us on this challenge. Uh, it is voluntary and I've been using um, or you know, utilizing leadership from my principals uh, throughout the district to help uh, encourage engagement. And they have been um, getting creative in how um, they are getting their staff uh, engaged. Um, so everyone receives the updates every week. Uh, we cover, um, uh, topics such as identity, uh, bias, uh, racial socialization, um, and, and things of that nature in order to just offer different perspectives, um, have us reflect on how we operate, what um, um, you know, racial um, or cultural responsibility um, or you know, education looks like in our classroom. And this will culminate um, parts of it in the PD we have coming up um, in May we'll be having a um, panel discussion and I will be pulling uh, topics from the racial equity challenge that we've covered so far um, as talking points to, you know, engage in a conversation, um, match it to some personal stories and experiences from people in the community um, to what I feel will help uh, these lessons 
uh, stick to our um, teachers and help inform us uh, in our actions going forward. So I'm really excited about it. Uh, very encouraged by the engagement um, that we've had in it so far. Um, and it's, um, it's good, great uh, support from the team here as well. Thanks, DeAndre. I'm really excited about the structure that he's put in place around adult learning. We can now leverage that um, module-based learning within the Canvas platform and begin to build out other opportunities for learning in, in, through other identities, right? So right now it's a racial equity challenge and we can build upon that, it's really exciting. We continue to meet with staff, we host open forums, DeAndre and I and the curriculum team uh, twice a month host open forums. These are uh, late afternoon or evening Google Meets where any staff member can jump on and talk about topics related to diversity, equity, and inclusion. Uh, it's one of the places where we've received a lot of um, that perception data, if you will, uh, in a more informal way. We are uh, continuing to engage in our learning of restorative justice practices. If you were able to join us for a recent PIC meeting, we had our friends from Jefferson Middle School share what that looks like in, in their school building, in their school community, as they are on the leading edge of that for us. We are continuing to learn as a leadership team and are uh, currently planning a summer, a pretty deep dive this summer for all administrators so that we can uh, clearly understand how restorative practice is uh, so central to building culture and meeting uh, that vision, particularly uh, our goal one target. And of course, that ongoing learning across the board. Um, Mr. Shero has prioritized that every time we come together as an administrative team through either our admin council or roundtable structure, that uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion is on the agenda. And DeAndre always has an opportunity to lead us in some learning or to talk about what's next for our school. So that's been um, a really great opportunity for us uh, at, to grow our own capacity as leaders. As we move into goal two, I'll remind you that is the comprehensive and balanced assessment system. A few quick updates on this front. Uh, we have implemented NWEA grades K-8. If again, at a recent PIC meeting, we shared uh, some data around that and painted a picture of how we're using that data in our K-8 classrooms and schools. We're really excited about what that will mean for us long-term, having that common connection uh, elementary through middle. And we have, really worked hard, uh, the folks with you on the screen today, have met with teachers and teams and individuals to really provide the professional learning and support so that teachers feel good about this. Uh, we've had lots of instructional technology learning and support. One thing that uh, this COVID pandemic and our periods of remote learning have really shown us is the power of instructional technology as a way to enhance learning. Um, I mean, we could have a whole other session just about that, but we are really proud of the work that we've done. Um, Melissa Toner, who isn't with us today, but has led that work for us. And teachers are feeling more comfortable and more confident in their ability to select instructional technology tools that really move learning forward. Um, again, a repeated bullet, but that's intentional so that you know that our equity audit really spans across both of these goals because we are looking at the whole child perspective. Uh, same thing with these two bullets related to the curriculum team. Implementing a culturally responsive education rubric and the work that we're doing to look at materials and resources is part of both of our goal areas. And of course, our continued focus on social emotional well-being, mental health. I'm sure if you have a pulse on anything in the media right now, you're hearing um, about the needs of adults and students to really support mental health and well-being. I'll pause for a moment and just invite anyone else from the team if there are additional comments you want to make um, or pieces that I might have forgotten. And uh, after that, we'll turn it back to Mr. Shero if he has some things to contribute. Okay, uh, we'll open it up then for questions um, or any comments that you might have. And uh, Mike, certainly any follow up that you might have. If you have questions, you're welcome to unmute and ask them directly, um, or you can use the chat.
Kim and Emily, you always have questions. Come on, one of you got to have something there. Uh, it's good to see. Put you on the spot. How's that? <laughs> yeah. It, and of course, we know Dan and Tammy does. I get lots of questions from Dan. Sometimes I don't want to answer them, Dan, but I always reluctantly do for the, for the Midland Daily News. So, uh, yeah, especially the last couple of weeks. How's that? We really, every time I see Dan's uh, an email or phone number, I go, oh boy, here we go. So, um, but anyway, and Lee, I haven't met you yet. Um, so you must be a new member. And Kay, if I have, I'm sorry. I don't remember. So we're, we're glad to have more audience um, alive and uh, this remote uh, period has certainly dwindled our pick numbers, and so we'll try to pick that back up, hopefully, in a little more normal school year next fall. But I think we're stuck in this format for the remainder of the school year. And uh, Cindy, uh, remind me, one more meeting, May? Correct. One more meeting in May. Yep. The third. Honey, I think we have a topic, too. Uh, well, we're going to see not. where we get now and then with some of this continuous improvement work and some other pieces that we have uh, moving forward and we'll come back to you for that. You know, one thing that we really would like to engage with uh, the PIC uh, group is that, that feedback group, right? I think this is a great group um, to share information and then pause and let you respond and provide us with the feedback that we need. It's part of that perception data piece as well. It's really hard to do that here um, when we're virtual. And I'm also sensitive to the fact that when we're recording and these recordings persist forever, that we might not always um, have the, the most open dialogue. So when we're back together, uh, we did that a few times last year where we paused the, the video and had a chance just for some open dialogue. I look forward to that. I will just say, um, yes, I think we're planning one more pick at graduation day. So that'll be a, a little tricky. Um, but we'll get a communication back out to you about that. So we're, again, just really excited about continuous improvement. Um, I think it is just such a powerful way for us to organize all of these pieces that we have out here in orbit. When we think about our multi-tiered system of support as really the, the key um, structural part that we need, and we bring these other pieces together under that, it just will help us have that flow that we need to, to do the work in the right ways and to resource it appropriately. So we are um, open to your feedback. If brilliant things come to you later today when you're out for a walk um, or driving in your car, feel welcome to email. I know you have Cindy's email um, or any of ours and we can share that across the team. We do have one chat. Yeah. We had Kim say very informative. Thank you. Thank you for highlighting the goals. Oh, thanks. And I'll just add too, I see Brian Brutin on the line, uh, Jeff Jasters on the line, and of course, um, you know, Mike, uh, although they didn't speak as much today, this really is a group effort that uh, Brian in his seat with finance, that funding part really matters and making sure that we're aligned in making decisions. And I don't want to in any way minimize the important role that Jeff plays in this. A lot of this work spans our areas of curriculum instruction and student services. So part of this work is us really coming together in alignment um, and, and partnership to do this. So they've been they've been great partners along the way. And I just want to add just, just real quick, I think I haven't been able to attend many PIC meetings just with, with my own schedule, but I I love the the flow of them this year because I think there has been that theme and it shows shows your commitment to to this work and the fact that you're doing an equity audit is just outstanding so really kudos I just think that's so important and and it just it just says a lot so thank you thanks for that feedback we had Sudi say thank informative and thank you yeah and there's there's certainly a lot of work going behind behind the scene every day in the district on the DEI and um, the blend, how it all blends together for us. And so hopefully you saw a little bit of that in the presentation. There's, you know, the social emotional learning, the, the multi-tiered system of sports. Uh, there's a lot of things that we're doing that um, all fits together in making um, a better learning environment and better output of our students on the other end. So we're very excited actually about it. A little bit tired at times, but we're pretty excited about it, uh, what's occurring. So 
Um, Sudi did send a question, so we've got a few minutes about staffing and how we're doing with staffing. And all of you probably have read many headlines about there's a national teacher shortage. Um, I don't think the universities have solved that completely and drawn more people in education. But luckily, MPS still continues to be a place where people want to be. And so we tend to, uh, a couple of years ago, we um, the pace of our staffing process um, quickened it up so we get to the market before anyone else does and we generally fill our spots very quickly. Um, we do get some surprise movement during the summer with a very young staff you'll have uh, people sometimes leave for uh, family situations or spouse, spouse situations and so we'll get a few of those that will get a little harder to fill later in the year. Um, so we've done pretty well doesn't mean it's easy. Um, the, there's a smaller pool and everything you do and then of course there's your specialty areas anything to do with special education or career technical education is nearly impossible to fill and that's even difficult for us so anytime we get a vacancy in one of those spots i think we all um, go uh oh what's coming at us and can we get it filled so far we have um, but we're there's that one is going to be a trick and at some point is going to be an issue going forward so so far with dental care and staffing we keep trying to negotiate up our lower end of our pay scales to stay very attractive at the lower end. If you know much about teaching, um, the, when they come out, that pay traditionally is pretty, pretty low in today's world. You know, maybe when you get to the top, you do okay, but it's the beginning that's so difficult for people to look at this career path going forward. So um, that's one area we keep trying to work on as well, as well as other HR recruiting processes, and that fits with DEI as well. And, and we've been making some real growth in those areas as we go forward. So um, hopefully that answers your question, Sudi there. And, and I'm just gonna close real quick. Yes, we plan on being in school on Monday and um, our numbers are half. So all the criticisms we got, and I don't believe it's just us pausing. I think there was a lot of trends that were gonna work in our favor, but our, if you've watched on the website today, our positive cases are now half of what they were 10 days ago. Our quarantine list looks a little big, but by Monday, um, about 80% of the secondary quarantines come off. So we're hoping, and you saw maybe headlines today that the state numbers seem to be going down. Still not great, but going down. So we look forward to finishing this school year strong, both um, in our co-extracurricular and academic uh, programs. In fact, uh, our principals are in discussion today. If there's a way to even do a prom, wouldn't that be great? But we're not real hopeful that students may or may want to tend to uh, socially distanced outside um, capacity limited prom. So we'll see how that goes. <laughs> it's not the prom all of us once to, went to, that's for sure. So um, we're gonna we're gonna look at it at as that as well. So sun, sunshine's coming out right now and I think maybe we're heading out the other end and keep getting vaccinated. We're getting them to our kiddos at 16 and up and that's gonna help. And we'll see what happens when we go this summer. So I, I think we're heading the right way. I know we've my fear always is when we get criticisms, do we do damage to ourselves? And, you know, I got a little fear over the last two weeks. Some of those people are, um, were, were quite angry and, and, you know, we always worry about losing customers, but um, I think I don't, I know that I don't know the answers to this. So it, it wasn't a right answer. There wasn't a wrong answer. And I'm certainly not an expert, but the good news is on Monday we'll open up and we'll get kids back in and numbers are lower for the time being. So about all I have left to talk about COVID. I don't want to talk about a whole lot more. So <laughs> thank you for attending. Uh, any final questions or thoughts? All right. Thank you very much for your time.